Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Farming Podcast brought to you by Private Property. My name is Mbali Nwoko, your host every Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is another special edition of the Farming Podcast, and we're speaking to a farmer who farms quite exotic plants. Some of them I've never heard of them before, and his farm's name is called Fadmir Riversdale, which apparently means farm more. So I think he's got such an interesting uh, story to tell for us, especially just what he does in his uh, farming operations and the various commodities that he incorporates into his business. And we're speaking to none other than Henry Finnamore. If you have any questions for Henry, please feel free to drop um, your questions on the comment below and just comment about what you think uh, regenerative agriculture is what your thoughts on regenerative agriculture is and how we could diversify, you know, in this industry. We'd like to hear your engagements and continue to subscribe to our um, uh, YouTube channel, which is on, which is private property. And uh, for this specific show, please go under the Farming Podcast playlist. Let's get straight into it. Henry, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm Bali. Yes, I'm well, thank you. Uh, hi to you and your subscribers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's always great to speak to a fellow farmer because, you know, people say farmers are always in their small corners, in rural areas, in very uh, um, outskirts areas as well. So it's great to speak to another farmer and get another farmer onto this farming podcast. So, Henry, you are the owner and farmer of Farm Favmir Riversdale. Tell us, what is it that you farm and um, are you a first generation farmer or has, you know, the farming bug been in your family for 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 years um bali yes um my great grandfather started off with dairy farming my grandfather continued and my father uh but then the line was cut there i think uh, dairy farming my dad always used to say it's a it's a prison without walls so um i i got <laughs> another prison without walls um Pratia farming is a bit like a jealous lover it uh, takes okay. all of your attention, especially, especially if, you, if you have a nursery, then um, things can become complicated, especially when you have um, uh, fun times when when FCOM switches off the lights and you've got to make plans to to uh, wet your plants. But I think you as a farmer will understand those those hardships as well, all difficult mm. difficulties. Um, mm. I think just. just just to put you in the picture, uh, uh, fermier actually means free free range in fr France, which, um, you know, that's when me and my wife uh, decided about seven years ago, we're going to say goodbye to Johannesburg and we moved down to Riversdale. Now, just to give you some background, um, you're a vegetable farmer or do you do other uh, products? Yes, that's, yes correct. that's correct. I'm a vegetable farmer. Yes, well, then you must speak to my daughter. She, <laughs> We've Got a uh, well. I started a business in uh, Benoni. It's called Field Fresh. About um, 2006, and we started supplying cut vegetables, soups, uh, processed um, beans, butternuts, anything you can think of. We had over a hundred lines that we were supplying to checkers and spa. So Ooh. possibly you can talk to her, and you can do some business together with my daughter. She's still there. Uh, I'm not there. I sold my interests in the business and I then moved down to Riversdale. So just in short, re regenerative agriculture came across my road um, for, a, I think, for lack of anything else, um, just the, the costs of the, the input costs. Um, when I studied agriculture uh, in 1984, uh, we were all we were taught about fertilizers and even where they were made, you know, the different fertilizers in which countries they were made, etc. And mm. when you start, when I was so out, long out of farming, coming back to farming seven years ago and just seeing how expensive input costs had become oh. and also uh, how the uh, pest and disease list has increased, oh. you know, for plants and for animals. In the time when I used to farm with my father, um, you know, just looking what he was doing, most probably the the amount of pests and diseases were 20% of what they are today. So mm. things have just, just become more difficult in terms of chemical requirements. So, you know, in general, everybody's farming chemicals nowadays. And if, if you look at um, 
uh, documentaries like Kiss the Earth and um, others, then, mm. then you will see that, you know, there are only so many crops left uh, before the uh, uh, elements in the soils are, are, are depleted completely. And, you know, we keep mm. on adding that just chemically. And there are other solutions. Um, you know, it was the, the farming the old way. Um, nowadays, you've got factory farming, and you've even got big commercial farm farmers. And I think some of them are also looking at alternatives, you know, for, like, for example, no-till has come into uh, agronomy where they do that with grains, where you try and keep the stubble on the mm -hmm. soil so that you can conserve the uh, moisture in the soil and also build up your soil. But uh, regenerative agriculture is farming the old way, you know, where people used to have the hens around the house and you used to have pigs and you had sheep and you had cattle and you had all of these elements in your farm. And without, I think, the old people knowing that these things were working hand in hand. You know, it's um, the way agriculture was intended was that, you know, you must have um, different animals on your farm so that they interact with each other and then you get the benefits of that as the grower, uh, whether it be the animal or the plant, because that interaction just means that you get healthier plants and animals. I think at, the more we have moved towards chemicals, the more dependency we have on chemicals, the more sick the system has become and also people in mm. general. If you look at just the the, the increase in cancer, you know, in people, um, is, it's just horrifying. So I think looking, that's why a lot of people are looking and, and, and wanting to turn back to the old ways. But the problem is mm. that you, you don't always get the remuneration for that effort you put in for growing things organically or more healthy. Mm. People are so um, bound by the uh, commercial farming side. And even if you look at the price spread, you know, from your farm gate to your retailer, it is only economy of scale that keeps a lot of farmers in business. Mm. So you've got to produce a lot of something to eventually make money with it. Because if you look at a, a, a broiler farm, um, you know, you've got five hen houses. Um, each hen house can take uh, up to 10,000 uh, chickens or, or fowls. So, you know, you as a small farmer, if you're trying to farm with eggs or with uh, meat broilers, you've got to compete with that uh, scale of production. And that mm. makes things difficult because then you need a client base that's actually willing to pay you for your product mm. so that you can get the benefit of that economy of scale because you are producing mm. a healthy product. And I think the closer you are to the cities, the more fortunate you are to actually have um, those LSM buyers that 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 have got a higher living standard and that will be and they're looking at their life expectancy they're looking after their their, their um, life and their health mm. so they they pay you actually for those um, let's call it um, healthy products that that you produce on your farm and obviously mm. everything has to be certified you know so um, mm. that. So, that adds an additional cost. You know, nowadays, if you want to export something, you've got to be good agricultural practices, um, you know, which is a good system. Um, it, you know, everything is developed for the benefit of health. Uh, um, I will support. So um, just in terms getting back to my farm, when I started, I started off with cattle. We went through a slight drought period. The farm was too small. Um, I then looked at alternatives and then there were nut farmers in the area and I had started a macadamia nut uh, nursery uh, and I was producing macadamia nut trees and then eventually I planted uh, trees for myself and then eventually I planted um, pecan nuts and almonds and my idea with that is if you look at the um, regenerative agriculture practices. And the, and the guy I follow the most is uh, Richard Perkins from Switzerland. He's got the smallest, most intensive little farm I've seen in the world. Um, but you can only do as much as what the climate offers you. So if mm. the, the higher the rainfall in your area, uh, and, and then I must also add, it must not be too high because then you go into subtropical conditions. But you also can't have too little rain. So you must sort of sit there in between, you know, in terms of rainfall. 
or you must be able to irrigate your fields from a, a irrigation system, you know, where you, uh, uh, where, you, where there's a dam that's providing mm. you water and you uh, are listed in an irrigation scheme where you get a, a daily or a weekly allotment of water and you can farm mm. with that. Because that's the only way really where I can see regenerative agriculture working well, um, because in your drier parts or your, uh, your very wet parts, you know, there's other farming conditions. You are limited because of the, the, mm. the weather conditions. Like, for example, the Karoo, you can, you'll only get niche spots where you can apply regenerative agriculture because you've got water. So in general, you need a good supply of water. Uh, you need good soil. And obviously the sunlight is for free. So mm -hmm. then if you look at you look at the basic concepts of, agri of regenerative agriculture, it is you're farming with a soil. You, the, the, the animals you are using or the plants you're using in your system is beneficial to the soil. So you're, I mean, the whole time you are building up your soil because you actually want those earthworms in your soil. You want, you want the mycorrhiza in your soil. You want the microbes in your soil. You want the fungi in your soil. You want carbon in your soil. I mean, we all talk, we all know about the, the, the big carbon problem in the world, that there's too much carbon and what it's doing to the world, it's heating up the world. So nobody taught me at Vasti that um, there's actually carbon in the atmosphere that you can, gen, you can harvest and put back into the soil. You must mm -hmm. only allow grass to grow on your, so, on your soil. So if you allow grass, grass is the biggest um, sink source for carbon can actually bind a lot of carbon. So in the past where I used to use Roundup in my fields to spray the macadamia trees to keep the grass off the roots and out of the fields, I don't do that anymore. So what I do now is I do a chop and drop. So I would take a weed eater and I would cut, I would mow the, law, the grass, I would mow the weeds. And I would also, I started to learn all the different kinds of weeds on the farm. So and I looked at the beneficial ones. You get soft weeds and you get um, hard weeds. And some of the hard weeds, you, they, they irritate you, but they put down the root systems that actually break up the soil. So that's beneficial for you. Soft weeds gives you a lot of leaf. So you can, if you chop it and it falls onto the soil, it forms that organic mulch that you need where you can actually build up um, the ideal conditions for worms to come in fungi to start growing and your, micro, your mycorrhiza. And you can also build up carbon in your soil. Now the scientists have proven for every 1% you build up the carbon in your soil, you're actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it in the soil. For every 1% you increase the carbon in your soil, you increase the, carry, the water carrying capacity of the soil by 250,000 liters per hectare. So that means if you can build up your soil, if you start off with a soil that's got 1% carbon in, in it and you can build it up to 5%, you've got an extra storage capacity of a million liters in your soil. That carbon actually makes the texture of your soil much better, the structure of your soil. So that means that the, the water can infiltrate much better and it gets stored for a longer period of time. So when your neighbor is experiencing drought in a, during a drought period, you will still have the benefit of that moisture in your soil because you've got extra carbon in your soil. So wow. yes, yeah. that's things that I'm looking at. You know, like for example, if you plant alfalfa, lucerne uh, in, your, in your fields amongst your trees, yes, they are competing with your trees, but they've, also, but they've got uh, rhizomes on their roots that are actually collecting nitrogen for you and making it available to the other plants. So now we know about this web, this, this web of um, interaction in the soil between plants where they actually exchange nutrients with each other to survive. So there's this whole network in the soil where uh, certain plants will have more selenium or zinc, which are micro elements, which other plants don't have. And they will exchange it for a favor from the other plant. The other plant might give mm. it some, some phosphorus or calcium. So there's this whole interaction in the soil that, is, that has got my interest. And since I've been applying these um, methods of farming, bringing in chickens, 
I eventually want to bring in sheep as well. I haven't got sheep now at the moment because my trees are okay. still small. So I don't want the sheep to damage the trees. So my trees must get a bit bigger. Then I will bring in the sheep. Then I don't have to uh, mow the grass anymore. The sheep can, can utilize the, uh, mm. the grass. So it's yeah. just, it's that whole interaction between we, we've got uh, chickens on the farm at the moment. They are, you, you cannot believe once you start watching them in nature, how much they, how much soil they can move around, how much they can dig and how much they can add value to the soil by the, uh, by adding fertilizer to the soil. Um, yes, it is raw fertilizer. Yes, you must compost it. Um, and, but just moving the hen houses through, through the orchard, we can already see the difference just in the, the trees in the areas where we are moving the hens just react much better. They are healthier and they, they just look happier than the other trees. Yes. In the orchard. So we are, we are slowly increasing the amount of animals on the farm as we have increased the, um, the, the nut trees. So the production. Yes. I don't know if you are familiar with the silver pasture, silvo pasture methods where they grow trees and then they have pastures underneath the trees, but you thin out the trees so that you have the benefit of the grass and you've got the shading effect of the trees. The trees have got all the fungal growth on them. Normally when a tree breaks down, it's got fungus associated with it. The uh, grasses have the, uh, the uh, rhizomes uh, uh, correlated to it. So you've got the interaction of the bacteria, the, the rhizomes of the bacteria and the fungal uh, spores on the trees so you get this interaction uh, that is all beneficial to the plants and eventually as i said if you've got healthier plants you've got healthier animals if you've got healthier animals and you slaughter them you're selling a healthier product to people and eventually you have healthier people you know if you look and at you general, have a I healthy mean, environment i think at the, and you have and you have a healthy environment at the end of the day because you know um all the different elements are working within each other and just supporting each other as an ecosystem. Before you go into further technical info, uh, Henry, you know, you've really unpacked regenerative agriculture quite well with different methods and obviously brought a so certain case studies of what you've done in the farm, incorporating chickens and soon to be sheep. Um, you know, for a farmer who's thinking, how do I apply these practices? And I want to start, you know, just to, to farm for a better tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where does a farmer begin to get such information? You know, um, you seem like you've got such an extensive technical knowledge. It's like, you know, you've, you've, you've really put a microscope in every level of your farming production. How can another farmer adopt these regenerative practices? Do they have to do just research? Do they have to speak to institutions? Or do they have to use the services of an agronomist, soil scientist, um, or any other scientists as well? You know, how can one start adopting these practices um, by themselves on their farms? I think it's a combination of what you said. Um, if you look at the internet as a wealth of, of knowledge, some of these uh, world-renowned uh, um, speakers on, on the topics like, for example, Gay Brown, who features in Kiss the Soil. I don't know if you've watched Kiss the Soil. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Okay. Gay Brown is the farm in America that shows how his, his neighbor's uh, land is flooded mm -hmm. with water and where his land is not because he's applying, he's mm -hmm. binding carbon in the soil. So, um, Guy Brown was in South Africa. He was in Cape Town. Uh, uh, he gave a talk. Um, there are different. Richard Perkins has been in South Africa. He gave a talk in Cape Town. I must be honest with you. I missed both their talks as well. I only uh, saw the programs after the fact, you know, after I, but I've, I watch their videos. I listen to what they say and mm. um, I apply what they say. I also do a lot of reading of my own. I do research. I do a lot of research on the internet because most you know, to go to your local library, you're going to get such outdated uh, information. Mm. Um, yes, there will be good uh, information, but it will all be based on the past, the commercial. You, you know, I'm not saying uh, uh, modern libraries are not modern, but most of them have got mm. computers as well now. You just go and you, you, you surf the internet. So there's so much good information on the internet. I think just read up about it 
and then get to know your own farm because every farm will be different. Mm. The weeds, the weeds on my farm is not going to be the weeds on your farm. It might be if we're in the same district, but if we are yes. in different districts, different areas, regions, it's going to be different. And then different weeds come at different times of the year. So you must devise a strategy for every weed on your farm. Like, for example, I have double keys. Um, you know, I just I just hate them because apart from that, you you cannot walk in the field. They just, you know, they, mm. they sting you wherever you go. Um, uh, I still have to use chemicals to kill them off. I haven't got any other mm. solution for them. Um, or you must just chop them when they're very young, but they're such they're so hardy, they just regrow and regrow. So, you know, you spend a lot of time with your weed eater in the field. So um, you've got to learn the different weeds. You've got to learn your soil, you know, your specific soil. If you've got a clay soil, a sandy soil, or a loam soil. I think always a farmer is so lucky to have a loam soil because that's in between mm. a clay and a, and a sandy soil. You know, it's, it's much better than, than a pure sandy soil and a, and, a, and a very clay soil. Those are the two difficult ones to work with. So if you've got a loam soil, which has got a mixture of sand and clay, then you are very fortunate. And then you can do yeah. a lot of things on your farm. Yeah. So, you um, know, get to know your own farm, get to know your own conditions, get to know your weather con conditions. I mean, I use YR as an app, uh, a weather app. I don't, you can use yeah. any app, weather app for that matter. But what I do is I always look at next week's weather forecast so that I know when it's going to rain, what to expect, so that I can, you know, do my planning according to that as well. Yeah, yes. 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 And so you've mentioned that you've got nut trees, um, chickens as well. So the concept of having to bring the, uh, the protea plants, was that also all forming part of uh, uh, regenerative agriculture? Or did you just see an opportunity with protea plants or protea flowers that you could um, start farming and, and, and trading with? I think, you know, you, you spoke about COVID when we started off, how it affected everybody. Yes, it was bad yes. for the flower industry. You know, it was terrible. You know, and the thing is, mm. if you think about it logically, you know, people don't eat flowers. They, they, they eat protein. They want nuts. Maybe, maybe they want meat first and eggs and milk and bread. And then they eat nuts, mm -hmm. you know. So um, flowers start becoming as a nice to have. So uh, mm. it's, it, 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 is a, it is a tricky uh, business um, and it is also economy of scale. So, you know, um, mm. I, think, I think the flowers came across my, my path as an opportunity because um, I just, I, I, I love plants in general. And um, I mean, if, you, if, if, you, if you've seen a King Pratia, uh, you'll, you know, you just fall in love with them. It's just such a beautiful flower. And um, I just wanted to, to plant them. So I've planted, I've planted, um, uh, you know, a hectare of, of King Proteas, and I'm going to expand further with the flowers. But I always, I want to keep a balance between the flowers and the nuts. You know, I, you, know I'm, you never know what's mm. the next COVID going, going to do. So I don't, mm. want to, uh, I don't want to get knee deep in, into the flowers, but the opportunity has come. And yes, um, we are I'm making cuttings we are exporting cuttings to, to, to Ecuador. So, um, you know, there are opportunities um, if you look for them. And to get back to, to pin cushions, the, um, the scientific name is a leucospernum. So you can, you can look them up uh, on the internet, but it's a, it's a beautiful color. It's got a variety of colors and it's, it, it's, you get them in deep red, you get them in yellow. You get them in in yellow with uh, with with red little stamens at the top. So you know it's it's different colors that you get, and they are very exotic. And they're one of our, as I said, one of our biggest export flowers uh, is um, uh, pin cushions. You know, apart mm. from the proteas. Um, if even if you look at you know if if you look at the variety within the plant kingdom, it is it is so wonderful i mean you know mm. some sometimes i'm just gobsmacked by the variety mm -hmm. that you know god's creation has given us if, if you look at yeah. proteas you know some people will talk about proteas and think yeah proteas okay but they are you know there's there's almost commercial there's most probably 30 30 commercial varieties and then you still get many more you know pin mm. cushions the same there, there are so many commercial varieties and then there are so many more that you find in nature so yeah. um, the diversity, the diversity is tremendous. And then I'm not even talking about you get the leucodendrons, 
the cone bushes, they are uh, ornamental flowers that they're also using the arrangement. They make little balls. Um, they've got little balls on them um, and, okay. and, and beautiful to put into an arrangement. So I think I've, I've given you, I've, next time you go to the flower market, you must go. <laughs> go, and go and check out all these new things I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, the pink, the pink cushions, etc. But Henry, would you think that, would you say that regenerative agriculture is quite an expensive farming process to adopt? You know, because, um, you know, when you go through very, very harsh climatic conditions and you can't spray chemicals and maybe you just don't have the budget to buy all these different things that could help, you know, the soil, etc. like invest in nut trees, invest in sheep, invest in chicken, invest in, far, uh, uh, in flowers. Um, you know, if you don't have all that money and capital to invest in all these resources, what do you do? So is, could one say that regenerative agriculture does come at a price? for the farmer specifically? Uh, I think, you know, now I've answered the question why well, I've got a nursery, because that's cash flow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, everything mm. I produce in the nursery, I can, I can sell within a year. So that gives mm. me a yearly income. So that allows me to extend on the other farming activities. And yes, we do mm. um, eggs locally. So we provide all the local restaurants and the road stalls with eggs. My wife does that. Mm. There was actually, she, she did a um, interview with one of the, uh, uh, with another, I can't remember who, but, uh, but um, uh, yes, I think, I think, yes, you are correct. Um, it's not as if we, I said, I don't spray any chemicals. So for example, mm. uh, rust is still a big problem on nut trees. Yes. Uh, uh, so I will, I will use copper and um, sulfur. In my, in my arsenal, um, which are chemicals, but it's more the old school chemicals. It's not got the, um, the chemical components that you know we are trying to go away from. I'm, I'm talking about mm. the copper and the, and, and the diethane is almost a contact uh, chemical. It's not okay. as if it goes systemic. It does not, it's not systemic, so it does not go into the plant um, and, and eventually into the fruit or the nuts that you eat. So they say Roundup is in everything. You know, they say you can, you can mm. go and if, if every person analyzes a bit of his fat, his stomach fat, you will find Roundup in it. Yeah, wow. so that's quite bad. Wow. Mm. As, we sum, as we sum up the show, Henry, what is just, you've mentioned quite a number of tips as well and things that farmers could do. Just maybe for a farmer that's just, you know, been farming for many years, who's so used to their, their farming practices and methods, and maybe that just want to adopt more the organic approach or regenerative agriculture approach. What are just some of the top short key uh, three things uh, or tips rather that you could advise to a farmer um, just to try and go in out and experiment regenerative agriculture to see if you know they could save some money back uh, at the end of the day so what are some of the top three um, uh, tips that you could give to farmers around regenerative agriculture or exploring regenerative agriculture as a farming option I think, um, you know, like everything in life, don't, don't jump head, head over heels into something new, you know, um, yes. adopt it slowly, you know, do it, do it on a small scale. I always say, you know, and I learned this lesson with when I started a macadamia nursery is don't do things on a big scale, you know, don't do mm. something so big that, you know, it overwhelms you. Mm. So um, just, just start off um, uh, small, you know, small, take yeah. one hectare on your farm. Take one hectare on your farm or 10 hectares, depending on the size of your farm, and slowly start changing your, um, uh, your practices there. I think the, I think the, most, the, the most important key, something a professor told us at university, said, the, and this is something that's become an, uh, a saying in agriculture, is, you know, the best fertilizer is footsteps in the, in the field. You know, so um, go into your field, go and look at your individual plants, look at their needs, mm. see how you can make life easier for them. You know, obviously, if you have big trees, I, I see that by me on the farm. As soon as you get bigger trees, protecting smaller trees, you get a microclimate. So now the mm. scientists are talking about, they're talking about the, the, the macro rain and also the micro rain. So you can actually create an atmosphere on your farm that's beneficial for rainfall because you are increasing 
the amount of foliage, you're increasing yes. the amount of humidity. So um, the plants start protecting each other. So you, you'll also find in a garden, try and start a garden off just with fine plants, you know, plants that are uh, soft. Now the sun will take them on the third day. So, you know, what you must do is first establish your tree and then you get, go to other plants. But to get back to your, your question, I think it's, it's take it slowly, see how you can improve your soil, do an analysis of your soil, see what the carbon content of your soil is, talk to an agronomist, find out how you can, carbon is for free. You don't have to buy it in a fertilizer format. You can actually pull it out of the atmosphere and put it in your soil. Nitrogen is for free. You know, so look at planting those beneficial plants, clover, for example, or, or lucerne. You plant in your mm. field, try and plant them so they don't compete with your main crop. But then um, I think uh, uh, Guy Brown from America with the Kiss the Soil, uh, they've got mixes of up to 12 to 14 different plants that they seed mm. at one time so that they can establish a cover crop. So that that yeah. gives the benefit to the main, main crop Plus, it gives the benefit to the soil, you know, that, that wow. green, green fodder that, that, that you're looking for. So I think, yes, look at the plant, look how you can improve that plant's condition. And, the, it, and as I said in the beginning, when we started off, it's not for everybody because you, you will find farmers that are farming in, in difficult climate, climatic conditions. He's got a maize farm, for example. Um, mm. You know, what can you do? In a, you, you can't plant trees amongst your maize farm now to make it you know, a better place for the maize. Yeah, so, yeah. There, you know, you're gonna, you, but maybe you can look at, at cover crops, you know, to improve your soil's health. So that you don't have to put in everything chemically, but you can slowly mm. start weaning yourself from chemical products. And I, right. I've seen it here by me. If, if you get plants that grow in natural conditions without having too much chemicals, they are just healthier. They just they work they're stronger. Yeah. Yes, they are healthier. So, but that it's it's it is a bit of a patience game. And as you rightfully said, is um, you know if you want to if you're a small scale farmer, what I'm talking about just becomes more difficult because mm. nothing in South Africa caters for small farmers. Um, yes, the the, the, the implements mm. are scarce. Um, the advice is scarce. Um, the competition is strong. You know, you've got to compete mm. against big commercial growers. So for a for somebody on a small scale trying to produce maize, you know, it is it's it's um, you co you're competing with a maize price that that's being done, you know, on on a large scale. So it just becomes more and more difficult. But right. it doesn't mean you can't it doesn't mean you can't do it if you want to be self sustainable. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but thank you so much for your time, Henry. I think all the tips that you've given are quite valuable. And I agree with you that the agricultural industry in South Africa does cater, especially more so for the commercial farmer. And it's very important to also note that not all the regenerative agricultural practices or farming practices can be adopted in every single type of farmer. You know, because like you said, if you're farming maize, you can't plant trees. And if you're farming maize, the last thing you want today is cattle, um, you know, going in and about about your maize and, and eating your carbs, etc. So yeah, I think that's quite detrimental, but uh, I, I agree with you. I think research is the most fundamental thing. Uh, maybe speaking to other farmers who also have adopted those processes, but thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, and I wish you all the best with your farming venture. And I will continue to maybe, yeah, I will actually reach out to your daughter because we're in the same vicinity. So um, I know about her company, but yeah, thank you for the tips that you've given and shared on the show tonight. Okay, Mbali, yes, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Uh, that was Henry Fenimore, who uh, is a farmer. And uh, we were speaking about regenerative agriculture. I think the most biggest tips that I, I learned from him in terms of how we can adopt these practices, basically starting small, trial and error, I think research is also quite important. And, um, you know, just just listening to some, some talks online on YouTube, listening to the farming podcast, because Henry definitely dropped some serious gems on how he's adopted regenerative agriculture in his farm, and also just some other tips like harvesting carbon, which is for free 
Who would have thought? So um, I hope you really found this conversation quite valuable. And um, keep uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel just to get more content around the farming industry and how you could improve your farming practices as a farmer. Once again, go to Private Property YouTube channel under the Farming Podcast playlist. This is where you'll find this episode with Henry. And um, yeah, that's it from me. And I wish you um, a very good evening. And I will see you soon. Take care. Thank you.